So you're in charge, you're in command here, Patty, as far as the controls go. Uh, looks like we have 10 folks that have joined us, 12. They're starting in, to come in hot and heavy now. I'd like to welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Jeff Jensen. I'm a field coordinator and program manager with Trees Forever, uh, based up in Northwest Iowa here, north uh, Northern Kasuth County, I should say. And we have a lot of folks that are now getting with us. Sorry about uh, being a little bit late here. We had to get some technical issues with the sound squared away, but uh, we can hear Patty loud and very clearly. So that's excellent. And I know we were supposed to start at 12 noon. Uh, we're gonna give it just another minute or two uh, so that any latecomers can join us. Again, uh, my name is Jeff Jensen, field coordinator and program manager with Trees Forever. I'd like to welcome you here to the Bird Friendly Iowa uh, presentation, a webinar that's gonna be presented by uh, Patty Reisinger, my colleague, and we have almost all the folks. Uh, so a couple of quick things. Uh, you should be able to see us and hear us. However, the only way that we can you can communicate with us is through chat and questions. So uh, questions can be typed in the questions box there. Uh, I'll be monitoring that throughout the day. If it's something pertinent and we can interject and ask the question, we will. Otherwise, we'll just collate them as we go and answer them at the end. Uh, we'll make it open source uh, so that uh, others can potentially uh, answer as well. And um, with that, I am going to hand it over to Patty. Patty, go ahead. Great, thank you. And then I need to, this is where I share my screen. Is that right? Yes, please, Patty. Okay. And I probably should um, close my camera. So tell me, do you see my screen then with the um, red headed woodpecker? No. No. Okay. Then let me. I can see you on the camera, but uh, we need to share your screen. Oops. Now I've lost everything. Oh, just a moment here. Um. Okay, I think I'm getting this now. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Oops. Okay. Now, um, you can see my screen. Uh, am I still on camera or on the screen, Jeff? Yes, you'll want to go ahead and click out of your camera. Okay. There we go. All right. Okay. Okay, very good. Well, we can't hear you, Patty. Are you there with us? Oh, well, I'm not saying anything because I'm trying to advance my slides and it's not happening. So, um, I think it has you as the organizer with the keyboard and mouse. So, can we change that? Or you could advance them. Well, let's see here. So you're in the uh, you're in your presentation. Click on the screen in your presentation, and then try the arrows. Well, I'm trying to use my arrows and nothing's happening. Could you just click on the click on the cardinal on the screen there and see if that 
Oh, we've got there it. We okay. Go. <laughs> There's so many buttons and dials. Okay. Hello, everyone. Glad that you've joined us. Um, happy to be here and sharing. Um, Jeff has been very helpful in, in, in uh, helping me prepare this, and we have a number of things to share. I uh, want to talk a little bit about the birds that will be seen in winter. Uh, it's looking like a nice fall day outside, but we're going to talk a little bit about some uh, birds that you'll be seeing this winter, and then also talking about the status of birds in North America. Uh, and then I uh, want to feature bird-friendly Iowa, what this new uh, criteria designation is. Uh, and if you're tuning in, I imagine you're a birder, you enjoy birds. Well, wildlife watching uh, expenditures in Iowa uh, is in the $868 million range uh, from a report from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, and a more, majority of that money is spent by birders, and this is almost twice as much spent by hunters and anglers in Iowa. Pretty amazing so it's big business uh, uh, we have lots of advocates out there people looking out for the birds and Iowa is a great place to be if you want to look at birds because Iowa is in the middle of the Mississippi flyway it's one of the most used of the four flyways in North America uh, many birds stop in Iowa as a place to rest and refuel during their long migration There are over a thousand species of birds in the United States and maybe nine to 10,000 worldwide. And we have a good opportunity to see many birds, hundreds of birds in Iowa as they spend time here through their migration or even as they're nesting in Iowa. I just wanted to look at a few of the birds uh, of winter and you may think well gee a robin that's that's a bird of uh but it, they are often uh here through the winter uh when they do move it's usually moving to find a food source rather than just because of the temperatures uh the american robin is one of the most recognized birds uh among the average american and the average american by some surveys show that they can uh, name 12 species of birds, and I think that's uh, great that they can recognize that many. The cardinal is one of the often ranked as the number one favorite among uh, people. Uh, it was originally found in southeast United States, but its territory has grown or changed, maybe partly because of planting trees in our prairie areas of the country, and maybe also through. Uh, climate, uh, the warming of the climate uh, has had an impact. So we're seeing them in farther north, even on into Canada. Um, so here's showing the male and how the female will look. Uh, the cedar waxwing is one of my favorites. Um, they are recognized partially by the black mask that they have. Uh, they like to eat berries, especially in the wintertime, uh, crab apples, cherries, service berry, and certainly the um, fruit from the cedar trees, as their name indicates. So uh, very fun bird to see. Uh, the blue jay, they're in the family of crows and ravens, and they are an intelligent bird, and uh, they have strong social bonds. They eat acorns uh, as a large part of their diet. The tufted titmouse uh, is found where there are large trees or wooded area. Uh, they will eat insects in the winter, or in the summer, and then in the winter eating nuts, seeds, and berries. Uh, their range has also expanded northward in the last half century, um, according to the uh, Cornell Lab of Ornithology. Um, that could be because of the popularity of backyard feeders. Uh, it could be some related to the changes in the climate. Uh, the black cap chickadee is one that I really enjoy, and it is common at our feeders. Uh, the interesting thing about uh, this bird is that they really rely on insects to feed their young. Uh, Dr. Doug Tallamy is an entomologist that's done a lot of research uh, related to birds and the connection with insects. 
And he has estimated based on his research that um, each uh, pair of, of nesting birds will feed between six and 9,000 caterpillars to their clutch during the nesting season. So the insects that we find on our native trees, native uh, plants in the woodlands are very important to the black cat chickadee and many of our other favorite birds that we're seeing. The white-breasted nuthatch um, is also common at feeders. Uh, they can be found also feeding along tree trunks. They're moving up and down, sometimes sideways, sometimes upside down, and uh, they're looking all around, and they often are found in pairs. The American goldfinch, that's the Iowa state bird, and it's here year round. Uh, it does change uh, its appearance in the winter. And here we see that the yellow is how we'll recognize it in the summer, but in the uh, winter, uh, they do get the uh, dull color. Uh, our summer residents of the goldfinch fly south and are replaced in our yard by friends, the other goldfinch from Canada. The dark-eyed junco uh, is another bird that comes from the north to spend winters in balmy Iowa. Uh, the dark-eyed junco is often thought of as the harbinger of winter. And when you do see them, you often see them in flocks on the ground. They like to feed on the ground. And uh, I enjoy seeing them as a, a sign that winter is approaching. Now some good news that's coming up. Uh, the American Eagle, once listed as an endangered in 43 of the lower 48 states, um, it is now, the population has, has rebounded. In 1963, there were just 417 nesting pairs in the lower 48. By 1998, there were nearly 6,000 nesting pairs around that time, and the American Eagle was removed from the endangered species list. I live along a river in eastern Iowa, and this is a bird that I see commonly every day. So I enjoy seeing the change that has come about with the American Eagle. Uh, the barred owl, it's a common cavity nesting uh, owl in our woodlands and wooded communities across Iowa. Um, that's the barred owl, and it is a permanent resident in Iowa, and they feed on rodents and rabbits. Want to move along and talk about the status of birds in North America. Well, unfortunately, there has been a decrease in the wild uh, bird population. And looking at the picture, you can kind of see uh, maybe one of the reasons why. Um, uh, some of the data that I will be using is based on the last 50 years. Uh, and there has been a decrease in the grassland birds. Uh, since 1970, over 50%. Uh, we've had a 17% loss of eastern forest bird population and a 37% loss of shorebirds. Well, the decline of these birds has been so gradual, we almost forget what was. We have to think about the landscape, not only in our yard or community, but in large territories. It's been a very altered landscape that just really does not support uh, birds or other wildlife. On the morning of May 5th, 2017, nearly 400 birds were found dead around uh, this skyscraper in Texas uh, after hitting the, you know, colliding in with the, the building overnight. And once this was discovered by the owners, uh, they shut down the exterior lights on the remain for the remainder of the migratory season. Um, and that is a tactic that uh, communities can use throughout the country. Uh, Cornell uh, estimates that a billion years, uh, a billion birds in the US and Canada die each year from hitting windows. But going back to some good news, as I said, the eagles are coming back. We've seen an increase in waterfowl 
uh, increase in the raptors and certainly uh, an increase in uh, wild turkey. And there is much that we can do. There, this, as we said, there's been a decline in some of the populations, but, but this is something we all can uh, take action and increase, um, uh, and take action and increase like native plants in our landscape, increase uh, plants in uh, our community that will help support birds. We can help uh, reduce pesticide use, have a pesticide-free uh, lawn or uh, landscape. Uh, we can increase the amount of habitat, we can increase the amount of native plants that will help feed the birds, and very important is to keep cats indoors. Keeping cats indoors will help protect the cats, help protect their life and uh, uh, their long life and, and their health, but also protect our birds. I want to spend the next few minutes talking about Bird Friendly Iowa, what it is, how you might get involved, um, and help knowing how communities and counties in Iowa are being recognized with this new designation. It is a statewide bird conservation and education outreach program created by a partnership of Iowa conservation organizations. Um, it, People are cooperating uh, as volunteers, and I wanted to uh, give a shout out to Rick Zarwell, who helped really launch this idea. Uh, he told me recently that when he was asking people uh, in these uh, conservation groups uh, to be a part of this committee of uh, Bird Friendly Iowa, that they all said yes. And so I think that speaks highly of the commitment of uh, the various people in the organizations and the value to um, the state. There are three main areas uh, that Bird Friendly Iowa addresses, and that's protecting uh, and restoring the habitat for birds, reducing the threat of birds. We've already talked about one, uh, just the collision with buildings and windows. And then another important part is to educate and engage people in birding and conservation. So many communities are already doing things, taking positive action in, in, in these various areas, but uh, we felt that it was important to uh, make this something official um, in designating communities and county, counties. So they're creating, enhancing uh, habitats that support birds, being uh, uh, taking direct action on that, taking uh, being direct in, in educating people about the importance of birds and the healthy ecosystem, and to provide public recognition for those who work to sustain solution for birds. Again, we talked about the gradual change in the population, and so uh, this is, really needs to be called out and uh, recognize those that are taking action. So uh, cities and communities that apply for certification must re, uh, meet certain criteria depending on the population. Uh, for communities, it's, it's based on population, how many criteria in certain categories. There's three main categories. Um, and then counties have um, additional um, choices that they can select upon in the criteria. And as Counties or cities are designated, they're officially recognized and presented with flag, two street signs, and a framed award certificate. When the individuals in Iowa were working on making this designation in Iowa, they were looking at considering uh, what had been done in Bird City, Wisconsin, Birdtown, Indiana, uh, Bird City, Minnesota, and Birdtown in Pennsylvania. So there were some early um, uh, initiatives in other states, and Iowa uh, has developed their own. And I know we have a listener in uh, listening in from uh, Illinois uh, and various parts of Iowa. So um, perhaps it'll continue growing. So it's it, we're really in the early phases of this recognition. Uh, there are six cities in Iowa that have been given the designation of Bird City, uh, Bird Friendly Iowa. Uh, first was Waterloo, Pleasant Hill was next, then Denver, and then this year in 2020, 
Madrid, Ames, and Fayette have been uh, recognized as bird-friendly Iowa cities. Uh, and Fayette will be recognizing, actually making the presentation at a city council meeting in December. We usually make the presentation at a city council meeting, um, and there's this coming up next month in December. Uh, and new uh, to the criteria uh, is a designation for bird-friendly Iowa counties, and that was new here in 2020. Um, three counties were recognized this year, Polk County, Story County, and Winnesheek County. Um, and let me just tell you a little bit about, as, as far as applying, there is a lot of information on the birdfriendlyiowa.org Friendly Iowa website. Um, communities can apply at various times through the year and get coaching on that. Counties can also get coaching. However, their uh, um, application time is at the end of the year, at the end of the calendar year. So I know there's some counties listening in today and have been working with some of the uh, committee members in learning uh, more uh, about the application. Uh, I do want to direct uh, everybody that's interested in going to the birdfriendlyiowa.org website. There's a wealth of information uh, on it, uh, information about uh, getting the, the neighborhoods active. Uh, there's information on nest boxes. There's information on plants that will help support uh, bird life uh, gives you information on uh, the growing conditions that are needed for those plants. And also much of the information that I mentioned here today about some of the birds is also on the website. So uh, plan to spend some time at the birdfriendlyiowa.org website. Uh, there is also um, a location that you can send in um, uh, a question to the the committee if you want um, if you have specific questions that you would like addressed we're willing to re respond to those uh, this slide is put in so that I remember that uh, every community to tell you every community can have access to funds for habitat for the native plants uh, with a community roadside plan and colleague Jeff Jensen is going to be talking about that a little bit more in just a a moment, um, but I do want to um, put up here the um, website for Bird Friendly Iowa. Um, you can, I'd say that'd be your first stop if you're wanting more information about the Bird Friendly Iowa criteria. Um, and also if you're interested in uh, supporting the effort of uh, supporting birds, and the education of birds and supporting the habitat, um, you're welcome to send donations to Bird Friendly Iowa, and Trees Forever is acting as the fiscal agent for um, Bird Friendly Iowa, so uh, funds can be sent to Trees Forever uh, for Bird Friendly Iowa. And I'm, well, I'll, I think I'll just save uh, any additional things. Uh, I'm going to have go back to Jeff and let you share some things. Well, thank you, Patty. Absolutely. Um, so let's see here. Do we have any questions? And if you do have any questions, uh, folks, please type them into the questions box. In the meantime, I'm going to see about taking the uh, the reins here. Let's see. And uh, let's see. Making. You got it. Okay. You got it. Just a second, but let's see if it comes up. Okay. Well, everyone, uh, I'm going to talk briefly about uh, roadside plans. Um, hopefully this will go full screen. There we go. Incidentally, this is a whole webinar in and of itself. Uh, what I mean by that is uh, we've actually given this to groups of uh, city administrators, uh, county, uh, pardon me, city administrators and city public works directors. And uh, certainly if that fits the need for your community, please email me at the end of this presentation or Patty 
and we can actually set that up so that we can do a, um, a, a webinar. The webinar is really to take the place of an in-person meeting. You know, typically, if we weren't in the age of COVID here, uh, we would be field coordinators out and about uh, working with our communities through the visioning process or through the many different programs we have with community forestry. Uh, and we would be stopping in to have these conversations with city administrators to let them know of the opportunity that exists for developing a roadside plan for their community, uh, especially if you're under 10,000 in size, it really is uh, very straightforward. In fact, we're going to get to that here in just a second, but I wanted to just put a plug in. Um, a, a lot of this information is available on the LRTF website. Now the LRTF stands for the Living Roadway Trust Fund, and you can see at the bottom of the screen there, the, the uh, link, uh, click on that, and that's going to get you to this LRTF, uh, Living Roadway Trust Fund website, an immense amount of information. So you should be able to spend an hour just on, on this website alone. You can see on the left-hand side there, all of the different areas from the grants that are available to information about integrated roadside vegetation management. That's kind of a mouthful there, but that's what we call the roadside plans. And so when I talk uh, throughout the remainder here of the next couple of slides about roadside plans, that's what I'm talking about. But then you can look at uh, other projects that have been developed through this program, uh, the different publications that are available to communities. If you've interacted with trees in any way, you typically might see us at a, a, a conference or at a, a booth. We're gonna have those LRTF booklets of the seeding guides or the trees and shrubs of Iowa or those great posters. All of that information is in that publication, so you can order them directly. Uh, so another great resource there. And then it has information on Iowa plants. So what plants might it be appropriate for a planting you're interested in doing to support insects, to support birds and other things. So I have to point this website out, a wealth of information, uh, and it's where you can actually find the application information uh, if you wanna poke around on your own. So real briefly here, there's kind of four steps to completing a community roadside plan. Um, basically, we have contact and learn, collaborate, document, and then simply sign and send. So contact and learn. The first opportunity is for a city or a local sponsoring organization to contact your Trees Forever coordinator. Field coordinators are spread all throughout the state. We have myself in Northwest Iowa. Uh, we have Brad Riphagen who lives in Greene County. He handles Southwest Iowa. Uh, we have Patty who uh, more or less handles Northeast Iowa and Emily Swihart, our colleague down in Southwest Iowa. And then we do have some other individuals around the uh, Ames, Des Moines area, and then the Cedar Rapids area where we have our headquarters in Marion. Uh, so if you contact one of those field coordinators, they can work with you directly. They can put you in contact uh, with me to do a webinar, uh, whatever the case may be. So they're gonna be able to explain a little bit more about what is a roadside plan, why they're important, who completes it, uh, some of those things. Now, ideally, uh, this information needs to be conveyed to both the city administrator and the mayor uh, because they're ultimately going to be the representatives that are going to sign the management plan that gets sent off to DOT. The next step is just to collaborate and again work with your local city street department supervisor or equivalent the public works director, uh, the trees forever field coordinator, uh, the mayor, city uh, administrator to just do this real quick and dirty interview. Not quick and dirty, it's it's relatively thorough, but it's quick and it's painless. Uh, we just wanna document some things like what, what are the actions they're doing in the roadside? And I may have jumped the gun here a little bit. When we talk about roadsides and communities, it's a little bit different than roadsides at the county level. Uh, we're all probably familiar with the, the roadsides on a county road, highway, um, gravel secondary roads, you know, that is the, the roadside, the, the ditch, so to speak. Uh, and that's what's managed by um, the roadside manager. If a community has or a county has one, either at the secondary roads department or with county conservation board. Um, but it's very distinct of what the roadside means there in the ditch. And in our communities, it's basically that right of way area between the sidewalk and the road uh, that uh, a lot of residents will just mow as, as part of the the mowing activities they do in their yard. If there's a tree there, uh, you know, they're typically gonna care for that too, not always. But that's what we mean by roadsides and communities. And so that's what we're really talking about when we think about a roadside plan for a city or a community. 
So collaboration is that second step so that we can document some of those activities for the supplemental, which is actually uh, put together by the Trees Forever Field Coordinator, just to document those activities uh, on a map. A lot of times we'll ask, where are you doing some of these activities? And so we can just point those out, highlight them, get them labeled. Uh, and then that all gets included into the management plan that gets sent to uh, the local, uh, to the DOT. So the, the kind of package that gets put together includes the um, application itself, or not the application, but the plan itself that's available on the LRTF website. And that gets signed by the city administrator and the mayor. Then there's going to be this supplemental that's put together by Trees Forever that just documents those activities, any maps of where those activities occur. And then finally, any tree ordinances that the community might have um, on the book, so to speak. We include all of that in that package. Uh, we sign and send. So again, the city administrator and the, and the mayor are gonna go ahead and sign that. That gets put on file with the DOT. And that is the document that allows then and makes communities eligible for grant funding on a yearly basis to provide habitat for, again, insects, birds, the, the whole realm. So uh, every June is the application deadline for different grants that are available through the Living Roadway Trust Fund. And these include, I think there's at present time, 13 different grant categories. Uh, not all of them may be applicable to communities or cities, but the, uh, the vast majority of them are. And so if you're looking for funding to plant trees, to plant native prairie grasses, things like that, uh, again, in those right-of-way areas, uh, that's going to be an opportunity for you to fund a project utilizing either native seed directly or funds to, to implement a project. So that's what our, our community roadside plan is all about. I've given you just a real brief teaser. Um, there's a whole webinar really where we go into some of the different components of the trust fund and then the, the process of, of how to put together an application and what those documents look like. Certainly contact myself or another one of the Trees Forever field coordinators. And, and we'll help you out uh, and, and steer you down that path and uh, hopefully get you on record so that next June, you're gonna be able to apply and, and put together a project. Okay, with that, uh, do we have any other questions? I'm going to bring up the questions panel and Patty's joining me here, great. And none yet. But um, that kind of concludes the formal presentation here, but we're gonna stick online for just a couple of minutes. If folks do have some additional information or questions, uh, feel free to type in that questions box. We'll get those answered. Um, if not, this was recorded, so we should be able to get this posted here. If uh, you missed part of it, or you wanna share this with a friend or a community, or uh, if you wanna go back and, and hear about some of the reference for roadside plans, uh, That'll be available to folks. Otherwise, everyone have a great day. Thanks for joining us for Bird Friendly Iowa. We really appreciate you um, joining in. And incidentally, look back at our webinars uh, page on the Trees Forever website, because we have a couple of coming up here, uh, one in two weeks on Prairie Through the Seasons, which is gonna be a fascinating journey with my colleague, Brad Riphagen on um, Prairie Through the Seasons. It's really self-explanatory. So with that, uh, again, if you have any questions, feel free to type them in. Otherwise, have a great day, everyone, and enjoy your lunch.
Hi, August. Uh, just got your question here. Curious about specific tree, shrub species, and understory vegetation that promote diversity of bird species in a woodland. Um, I'm not sure I have all the answers, but certainly uh, some some good options are going to be any of the the fruit and nut bearing uh, things. So, so viburnums are going to be great. Service berries, uh, the hazelnuts as a shrub are great as an understory. Um, you could look at things like um, nine bark. Um, what else? Patty, are you with me here yet? Um, and I'll actually type a couple of those in. So. I hope that ha uh, helps to answer your question there, August, and thanks for it. That's a, a great question. Oh, hi, Lois. Uh, Lois, let me see if I can actually email you directly. And if not, let me see. Um, oh, let me just type in Patty's email. Bear with me. So Patty can be contacted at uh, preisinger at treesforever.org. Uh, so that's how you can send her a direct email and she should be able to get it. I don't think she's with us online though, so uh, you will need to go ahead and, and uh, email her directly. And I'll follow up and let her know that you had asked about that. So thank you, Lois. Well, I'm going to wrap things up uh, again. want to thank everybody for joining us and uh, have a great day.